This chapter book is called The Legend of Spud Murphy. The author who wrote the Artemis Fowl books is the same author who wrote this book, Owen Colfer. This part one will include chapter one and chapter two. You can see here on this page that Owen Colfer wrote his signature in this book, E. Period Colfer. And on this page, you can see there are five chapters. Ugly Frank, Stay on the Carpet, The Test, A Good Book, and Off the Carpet. Here begins the legend of Spud Murphy. Chapter 1, Ugly Frank. I've got four brothers. Imagine that. Five boys under 11, all living in the same house. On wet summer days, our house gets very crowded. If we all bring two friends home, then there could be 15 of us crammed into the house. At least eight will be roaring like lunatics, and the rest will be dying to go to the toilet. The flusher in our toilet snaps off about once every three months. When my dad came home one day and found three sons and four strangers covered in war paint swinging on the bedroom curtains, he decided that something had to be done. It didn't help that the war paint was stolen from Mom's makeup box. No more bringing friends home, Dad declared after the warriors' his parents had collected them. That's not fair, said Marty, the biggest brother, mascara streaking his cheeks. That punishment really affects me because I'm popular, but Will's best friend is his action man. Will, that's me. I love that action man. Donnie, Bert, and HP started complaining too, but only because they're little brothers, and that's what little brothers do for a living. I know that technically I'm a little brother too, but I'm in the big brother half of the family. Having one little brother is bad enough, but having three is too much punishment for one person. That's enough punishment for an entire housing estate. The trouble with little brothers is that they are never blamed for anything. All Donnie, Bert, and HP have to do is bat their blue eyes and let their bottom lips wobble a bit, and they are forgiven for everything. Donnie, Bert, and HP could stick an axe in my head, and they'd still get off with 10 minutes no TV and a stern look. The only thing that Marty and I ever agree on is that our three younger brothers are spoilt rotten. This house is a madhouse, said Dad. And he's the chief lunatic, I said, pointing to Marty. I'm not the one talking to dolls, retorted Marty. That hurt. Action Man is not a doll. Quiet, said Dad through gritted teeth. There must be something we can find for you to do during the holidays. Something to get you out of the house. Not my babies, said Mum, hugging the younger brother squad tightly. They gave her the full baby treatment, big baby eyes, gap tooth smiles, and HP even sucked his thumb. That kid has no shame. Hmm, maybe not those three, but Will and Marty are nine and ten now. We can find something for them, something educational. Marty and I groaned. Educational hobbies are the worst kind. They're like school during the holidays. Marty tried to save us. Remember the last educational hobby, the art classes? I was sick for days. That was your own fault, said Mum. I only had a drink of water. You are not supposed to drink the water that people use to wash their brushes. Dad was thinking, what about the library, he said finally. What about it, I said, trying to sound casual, but my stomach was churning. You both could join. Reading is perfect. How can you cause trouble reading a book? And it's educational, added Mum. Yes, of course it's educational, too, Dad agreed. How is it educational, I asked, terrified by the idea. I'd much rather be outside riding a horse 
than inside reading about one. My mother tussled my hair. Because, Will, sometimes the only horse you can ride is the one in your head. I had no idea what that meant. Don't make us join the library, Marty begged. It's too dangerous. Dangerous? How could a library be dangerous? Dad asked. It's not the library, Marty whispered. It's the librarian. Mrs. Murphy, said Mom. She's a lovely old lady. The problem with grown-ups is that they only see what's on the outside. But kids know the real truth. People forget to be on their best behavior around kids because nobody believes a word we say. Every kid in our town knew about Mrs. Murphy. She was one of those people that kids steer clear of. Like Miss White, the teacher with the evil eye. Or, or old Ned Sawyer, the tramp with the dribbling dog. Um, she's not a lovely old lady, I said. She's a total nut. Will, that's a terrible thing to say. But but she is, Mum. She hates kids. And she used to be a tracker in the army, tracking kids from enemy countries. Oh, now you're being ridiculous. She has a spud gun under her desk, added Marty. A, a gas-powered one that takes an entire potato in the barrel. She shoots kids with it if they make a noise in the library. That's why we call her Spud Murphy. My mother thought this was all very funny. A spud gun. You'll say anything to avoid reading a book. It's true, Marty shouted. Do you know Ugly Frank from number 47? My mother tried to look stern. You shouldn't call poor Frank ugly. Well, how do you think he got that way? Spud Murphy spotted him. Mom waved her hands as if two annoying birds were flapping around her ears. I've heard enough. You two are going to the library for the afternoon, and that's it. We'll make some sandwiches. We stood in the kitchen glumly. Sandwiches wouldn't be much use against Spud Murphy and her gas-powered spud gun. Chapter 2 Stay on the carpet. Of course, the little brothers thought this was hilarious. Nice knowing you, said Donnie, shaking my hand. Yes, said H.P., the word whistling through the gap where his front teeth used to be. Nice knowing you. Five years old and already a smart aleck. Can I have your walk, man? Asked Bert, who was already wearing it. I swatted them with my action man. Do you hear that, Mom? They're teasing us already. Oh, they don't mean it, said Mom. Do you, my little men? No, Mummy. Mom gave them a jelly baby each. I thought my head would pop with the unfairness of it all. Now, Marty and Will, go upstairs and wash off the rest of my lipstick. We leave in ten minutes. There was no escape. We pleaded and whinged for ten minutes solid, but Mum was not giving an inch. The library will be good for you, she said, belting us tightly into the back seats of the car. You might even learn something. As we drove away, we looked back towards the house. Donnie was at the bedroom window, enacting a little play for our benefit. He had scrawled the name Spud across the front of his white T-shirt and was scolding a small figure standing on the window ledge. My heart jumped. It was Action Man. Donnie scolding grew more and more furious until eventually he picked up my unfortunate toy by the heels and began whacking him against the ledge. No, I squealed. Stop the car. Donnie is killing Action Man. Mom laughed. Really, Will? Killing Action Man? You have to come up with something better than that. Through the window, I could see Bert and H.P. clapping wildly as Donnie took a bow. Mom dropped us at the library on her way downtown. I'll pick you up on my way home after I collect your dad from work. We nodded, both too scared to talk. Mom pointed her fingers at us like two imaginary guns. Try not to get spoiled butted, okay? She was joking, but we couldn't laugh. 
We couldn't even manage a smile. Mom would be sorry when she came back and our faces had been blasted by soggy potatoes. Right, off you go, up the steps. I'll just stay here to make sure you go inside. I growled quietly. Our plan had been to hide around the back for a few hours. Mom was smarter than we thought. We climbed the concrete steps to the library doors. I decided to go first because Marty told me to. You're probably wondering what we were so scared about. I bet you're thinking that we were a pair of gutless chickens who would have been better off at home sewing our names onto handkerchiefs. But that's because you think libraries are happy, colorful places where the librarians actually like children. That may be what most of them are like. Oh, but this one was different. It was a place where serious men read serious books and nobody was allowed to show even a glimmer of a smile. A smile could get you thrown out. A titter could get you spudded. And if you laughed aloud, oh, you were never seen again. A little boy rushed out of the library straight into Marty. The boy had tears coming out of his eyes and someone had obviously been dragging him along by the scarf. He grabbed Marty's jumper. Don't go in there, he cried. For the love of God, don't do it. I was one day late with five go to Smuggler's Top. Just one day and look what she did to me. And just like that, the boy was gone, trailing a wrinkled scarf behind him with only a puddle of tears to prove that he had ever been there. Wait, we cried after the fleeing figure. Tell us what Spud did to you. But it was no use. The boy had disappeared into the back of a dark car and sped off to safety. There was a porch outside the library. The porch's walls were covered with posters about things like book groups and art competitions, all very educational. We looked at the pictures on the posters anyway, anything to put off going into the library itself and facing Spud Murphy. We stayed there until Mum came up the steps and knocked on the window. <laughs> we had no choice but to go inside. It was just as I feared. There was nothing in there but books. Books just waiting to jump off the shelves and bore me silly. They seemed to watch me from their perches. I imagined them elbowing each other. Look, they said, two more kids having too much fun. We'll soon put a stop to that. The library seemed to go on forever. Row after row of wooden bookshelves bolted to the floor at the bottom and the ceiling at the top. Each row had a ladder with wheels on the upper end. Those ladders would have made great rides, but there was zero chance of children ever being allowed to actually have fun in here. What do you want? said a voice from the other side of the library. My heart speeded up at the very sound of that voice. It was like two pieces of rusted metal being rubbed together. I held my breath and looked across the huge room. An elderly woman was leaning on a massive wooden desk, her knuckles bigger than acorns. Her gray hair was tied back so tightly that her eyebrows were halfway up her forehead. She looked surprised and angry at the same time. It was Spud Murphy without a doubt. I said, what do you want? She repeated, banging the desk with an ink stamp. We walked across to her desk, clinging to each other like two frightened monkeys. There was a whole box full of ink stamps on the desk and two more hooked into her belt like six shooters. Spud Murphy glared down from a great height. She was big, taller than my dad and wider than Mum and my two aunties strapped together. Her arms were skinny like a robot's and her eyes were like two black beetles behind her glasses. Mum says we have to join the library, I said. A full sentence, not bad under the circumstances. 
That's all I need, grumbled Spud. Two more urchins messing up my shelves. She took a pen and two cards from her drawer. Name? M -m 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 Mrs. Murphy? I stammered. Spud sighed. Not my name, dummy. Your names. William and Martin Woodman, I shouted like an army cadet. We had surrendered our names and our address was next. I was a bit worried about that. Now Spud knew where we lived and could track us down if we ever forgot to return a book. The librarian filled in the cards, stamping them with the library crest. Pink cards, she said, handing them to us. Pink means junior. Pink means you stay in the junior section of the library. Marty noticed that the toilets were in the grown-up section. What if we have to um, go? Spud threw the stamp back in the box, slamming the lid. Think ahead, she said. Go before you get here. Spud led us down long aisles of wooden flooring to the children's section. She wore woolly slippers on her feet that polished the planks as she glided. That, she said, pointing a knobby finger, is the children's section. The section was actually a single box shelf with four rows of books. On the ground before it was a small patch of worn carpet. Do not set foot off that carpet until you leave, she warned. Whatever boyish idea enters your head, ignore it. Stay on the carpet or there will be trouble. She bent over almost double until her beetle eyes were level with my own. Is that understood? I nodded. It was understood. No doubt about it. And that's where part one ends, but it is to be continued. Part one has included chapters one and chapter two from The Legend of Spud Murphy, written by Owen Colfer. It's to be continued in part two.